In this, the month that in the United States we celebrate Thanksgiving, I thought it would be appropriate to interview Al Walker, a CSP and member of the Speaker Hall of Fame. And I want you to check out Al's marketing approach to associations. It's, it's simple yet highly effective. In addition, a part of this interview reflects Al's work as the chairman of the NSA Foundation. The NSA Foundation is the philanthropic arm of the National Speakers Association and serves to help those members and families of our NSA communities, as well as those in need in our larger global community. It's devoted to upholding the spirit of serving, sharing, and supporting embodied by our founder, Cavett Robert, CSP, CPAE. The foundation is able to act on behalf of our members to do something that comes naturally in the speaking profession, helping others. And now here's Al Walker. Hi, this is Chuck Gallagher with Voices of Experience, and my guest today is Al Walker. And, and I have to say, Al, I'm thrilled to have you yeah. with us. I'm thrilled to be um, here. CSP, CPAE Hall of Fame, and the chair of the Board of Trustees for the Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, past president of NSA. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the Carolinas chapter, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm in the Carolinas chapter with so many folks who have wonderful careers yep. and, and are continuing with NSA. But Al, I, I'd love to talk with you about the perspective of going from the beginning of your career to the Hall of Fame. Because there's a lot of things that you've done, but over time you've weathered all of the experiences that speakers have to deal with that have, that's carried you from, from start to Hall of Fame. Take us on that journey. Well, this is going to take a couple of days. <laughs> okay, Canada. we don't have a couple of days. <laughs> And I don't know how to do the Reader Digest condensed version of that very well, other than the fact that, like so many people, when I was in college, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. I just knew that I needed to get a degree and got a job. And the second guy I worked for insisted I take a Dale Carnegie course in 1972. Wow. And uh, I, about halfway through, the instructor told me that, he said, I want at the break, he said, I want you to stay around and let's talk after class. And in my entire academic career. Anytime a teacher said, I want to talk to you after class, it was not a good thing. So I sat there the rest of that class going, what, you know, what did I, what did I do? Where did I mess up? What, you know, what's, what, what's this about? But anyway, we, we got through and we met and he said, I've been teaching this class about 15 years that I've never seen anybody with your kind of talent. I said, you got to do something with this. And Well, that's awesome. I know. So I still had, speaking had entered my mind, but I became a Dale Carnegie instructor and then went to work with Carnegie in the early 70s and worked with them until 79 when I left and had a uh, two-year non-compete clause. So I abided by that and was director of sales for a general contracting firm. And with the understanding in two years, I'd gone. And it worked out very well. Right after I had done that, I still had permission from the to do some speaking. So I started doing a little bit. And I remember the first person ever called me was a contractor out of Atlanta who said we're having a, and I had done a lot of training with their people. He said we're having a gathering at, uh, down here in, in near Atlanta and want you to come help us give some awards and just have some fun and play golf with us that weekend and I said well, we're gonna do some training and stuff he said no you trained everybody we just want to have some fun and want you to tell some of those crazy stories so I did that and he paid me for doing it and I thought well this is a lot easier than putting workbooks together and doing all this training <laughs> stuff so, um, and then I had a mentor of mine uh, Robert Numa James Bob James who lived in Glastonbury Connecticut and one of those people that I trusted so much that if he'd said, go sit up on the roof and eat a jar of peanut butter and you'll be a, be more successful, I'd have been up to eating peanut butter. And but he said, uh, I just came back from a meeting. This is right after I started in October of 81 when I did start my own business. He had said, I just came back, and this was like January, came back from a meeting in New Orleans with a bunch of people just like you. He did not ever go back to NSA. I had never heard of NSA. And he said, but you need to join. I called up and joined. It, like I said, it, whatever he told me to do, I did. And I got gotcha. you. Did not go to a meeting, didn't think I needed to, because I was building my training business. Still not doing much speaking at all. And then and went to my first meeting in January of 83, which was a winter workshop in Nashville. And it, the rest is history. I've missed one meeting. That's because a tree fell on my house about two days before the convention in New Orleans about 12, 15 years ago, however long ago that was. but. Uh, I've been at most of them since then, and I, have, I am truly a student of 
of NSA and a product of NSA. Uh, everything I do in my business have ever done, I learned here. And I don't know, I can't imagine somebody being serious about our business and not being a part of, of right. NSA. I just talked to a young guy this week who's wanting to get into speaking. He's done a few freebies for schools and other things around our neck of the woods in South Carolina. And I told him, I said, the only thing I can tell you to do is join NSA. I can give you a little help, but you need to find out what's going on in 2018 not what a guy may did 20 years ago, so cause I'm not sure that's working quite as well now as it did then. But I just, it evolved, and I, I came to NSA, found it, I could make a living speaking, and I had a little cassette tape and a little little brochure, and went to around Columbia, because that's where all the, uh, I learned all the associations camp out in state capitals, um, not so they can be convenient for us to get to, but so they can lobby their legislators, and. It, it worked well enough. I booked a couple of things. I went to Raleigh and stayed a week at a hotel up there in, near Crabtree Mall. Called on every association exec. Got a couple of bookings out of that. Spoke to the North Carolina Association of Society of Association Execs. Got some more out of that. And went to Atlanta, did the same thing there. Went to Tallahassee, did the same thing there. And kept picking up clients and bookings. And got busy enough after Tallahassee that uh, I just, I never went to another state capital, but my goal was to go to every one of them. So I tell people if push ever comes to shove, I still got about 46 state capitals to get to. Okay, <laughs> so now, days. there's something that you said that, that really strikes me. I did not know this about you, but what I just heard you say was that in order to build your business, you built it in large part by visiting state capital associations that are headquartered at state capitals yeah. and pitching yourself. Yeah. So not only were you training other people in the fine art of selling, but you I'm were applying mm -hmm. the fine art of selling yeah. to yourself sure. and just looking at what would appear to be the low-hanging fruit, yeah. which created a business model that has served you for decades oh. at this point. Well, I learned somehow early on that all, or at least most of the successful professionals uh, in other businesses, other industries, and successful businesses were members of their state national associations. So if I could go speak to the associations, get them to pay me for being there, in essence, they were paying me to market to their members. Right. And so I never saw a speech as an end-all, be-all. The speech was not the goal. The speech was just a stepping stone to all those other organizations that were a part of that association. and. I spoke to the North Carolina Convenience Store Association. The guy that uh, was the editor for the Convenience Store Magazine nationally was there, wrote an article on me. I got a call a few weeks after it came out from England, and the uh, guy said, uh, just read an article on you in Convenience Store Magazine. He said, I'm running the eight to late stores. They couldn't, they were all, it was a co-op. They couldn't for, tell people when they had to open and when they had to close, but they used the 7-Eleven model. So they all opened by eight and they closed late. So I'm call, they call them all eight to late stores. And <laughs> he said, he said, we're coming to, uh, to Disneyland and want you to come out and speak to us. I said, well, you're in England. I'm in South Carolina. There's one a little closer called Disney World we could all go to. He said, I know we went there last year. <laughs> so I went to Anaheim from South Carolina to speak to uh, eight to late stores uh, because of that speaking to a North Carolina Society of Association, I mean, execs, which got me to the Convenience Store Association, which got me to that international course. When he called, I was anticipating going to England, starting my international. It was a few years later before I got to speak internationally, though. So, You are the head of the NSA Foundation. Yep. And the NSA Foundation does a lot of really good work. Yeah. And this past year, uh, there were some um, major events that took place, disasters, disasters mm -hmm. that really impacted a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And and I'd love for you to 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 share with to share with the audience the impact that NSA members and their contributions made toward helping people who really found themselves not because of choice in a real circumstance sure. of need. Sure. The NSA Foundation was started because of one person being in need back in the late 70s. A guy named Frank Betcher who wrote a book, How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. It was a big bestseller. And he was very successful, but he was up in his 90s. He'd sold insurance earlier and had a ton of insurance, but they had outlived their assets. He, his wife called a speaker friend. He was not in NSA, but called a speaker friend in Atlanta 
and asked for some help, and he called a bunch of other CPAEs at the time, and they all set a goal to raise $100,000, and they did. Every CPAE contributed to that fund except for one, and I, I never knew who that was, so we can't out them. Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> but 99.9% uh, .9 contributed, and when she passed away, she had in her will that they would pay that money back. And when they got the checks, they said, let's start a fund. So that's how the fund got started back in, and became a 501c3 in 82 under the leadership of when Nito Quivain was president, and uh, he's now chairman emeritus of the foundation. And all of that leads us up to this past fall when, when the first hurricane hit, um, hit Houston, and we knew we had some members in need. And we've done this over the years. We did it with Katrina and some other events like that where we sent the call out to NSA, to our membership, uh, to, to help. Because our foundation set up you know, three or four arms. One is PSBF, which was the initial one because of Frank, that initial fund started to, as a professional speaker benefit fund. And then we have, now we have scholarships we've added. Now we also have the Art Berg Fund, which is a technical grant we give to people. And the fourth one we've added is where we, four years ago, is where we contribute to a local charity in this town where we're having our national annual, you know, convention. Um, sure, to get, yeah, like Dallas know, is coming here. Yeah, sure. Dallas is coming here, that's right. And influence. And uh, so the, with PSBF, they have to go through, there's an application to fill out, there's a process, the committee decides, what kind of grant to give somebody, what kind of, if they, yeah. could be cancer, could be, we had one lady had a tree fell on her one time riding a bike paralyzed from the waist down and uh, they helped her, you know, I was chair of the committee then. And, but this path, but because that takes some time to process those, we needed an immediate help. So we started raising money and just at our meeting, just this past couple of days that we've had here in Baltimore, we have set up a contingency fund because we had enough money raised, we were able to help everybody who needed help in Houston and in East Texas, and then in Louisiana, and then another one hit and in Puerto Rico, as we all know, So, and in Florida, there, there were several people who needed help there, and uh, we were able to help all of our members with some immediate you know, help cash-wise, and so a, lot, a lot of them just lost everything. And then it, what was fascinating to me was we raised enough money that, and Jim Pancero led this, charge and uh, Marilyn Sherman was head of the, she's head of the C CSP uh, she got all the CSPs to make phone calls and what came back were members saying I just cannot believe how quickly y'all responded to this because it was within a matter of days and Brian Walter being our president you know helped lead that charge as well and we were all heavily engaged in that as soon as it happened and on the phone and contacting members and getting checks sent out after we raised money because we actually took some money out of PSBF to initially fund that, but then put it back into PSBF once the money was raised so we could immediately do something. And ended up with about $38,000 left over and went back to some of the people and said, well, we got a little money left over, needing to help every one of them. Told, nope, I'm good. Uh, I, I've got myself taken care of. Now, how many people would, you know, would do that? Right, A right. lot of folks would say, oh, yeah, okay, I need, you got some more money? I'll take it. You know, how much you got? Sure. <laughs> and, sure. But they didn't. And so we, we've set up a, uh, we're not calling it a hurricane, which was the main driving force behind this last one. It's just a disaster relief emergency fund, which is a new line item in our in our foundation. That the seed money is at thirty-eight thousand. Well, Al, I have to say, uh, you know, I've been around a while, mm -hmm. a little oh, yeah. over ten years sure. now, and and I've seen what's happened, and especially under your leadership with the foundation. So, I, as an NSA member, mm -hmm. thank you for the leadership. Right. and the willingness to be able to connect the dots with people so that they can actually yeah. make contributions. Al, thank you yes, for not losing your curiosity Good. and for therefore the leadership that you continue to provide. This, this is an awesome interview here for VOE Good. and I appreciate it ever so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Al Walker. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. As we end this interview with Al, may I take the editorial privilege to encourage you as NSA members and those in the NSA community to go to the nsaspeaker.org website and make a contribution to the foundation. You never know when your contribution will be the lifeline offered to a member in need. Give generously, for as you give, so shall you receive.